stuff going on behind me. Yes, you can see. And uh, at my feet as well. Um, but first, um, I wanted to thank everyone who has supported me in the last week or so uh, with orders. So <laughs> thank you so much for that. Uh, this month has been really expensive just because I've got to pay for my academic robes for graduation and I have to prepay a deposit for my um, graduation dinner and um, yeah, I've, either got, I've got some other bits and bobs coming up that I, I have to pay for now so um, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was just like, well, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how the month turns out. <laughs> So yeah, I'm really glad that those orders came through. Oh, anyway, so speaking of shops, I decided to turn my Etsy shop back on. I got some advice from a local to me um, Etsy seller who has a shop basically catering to a lot of people in the US and does extremely well, gave me some tips. And so um, I decided to turn it back on uh, so for anyone out there who prefers to shop on Etsy, I'm still on Etsy <laughs> and for those of you who might like have Etsy credit or uh, gift cards, um, being open on Etsy obviously means that you can actually use those in my shop if you, if you want. Um, so yes, I am now available on Etsy again. Um, Next thing I wanted to talk about was I got a bunch of new containers for dyeing. And so I've kind of gone a little crazy. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of wool there <laughs> that's been dyed. I, I've not turned on my front light here because it's pretty sunny today. It's like partly cat cloudy this afternoon. Um, so, uh, at any rate, you're going to end up seeing it in the shop in one form or the other. <laughs> um, so, yeah, last time I showed you a bunch of yarns that I was sent from, um, the spinning mill. And so I just experimented with dyeing them to kind of get a sense of what I liked about each yarn because each yarn was made to a specification so um, basically for those of you who don't know what you do is whether you have one fleece or an entire flock and you want them all uh, produced together to make either a roving or yarn you send it to the mill they get some details about how you want it processed and spun and they make that for you so um, these were just off samples. Actually, this is the hand spun that I made during the live stream where um, I was working with North Ronaldsey. It's the hairy wool episode I did uh, probably three or four weeks ago. Well, it's at least three weeks ago. So I went ahead and dyed it just because I had it. <laughs> um, so uh, yes, yeah, so this was a, a good opportunity for me to see um, what I would be interested in uh, in terms of getting yarn custom made for me. So, yeah, got a lot of those yarns. Um, I've also been experimenting with new colorway ideas. Um, if you, I, I mean, if you want to see these. Um, in better detail, not on my teeny tiny little camera screen, <laughs> then uh, I could take pictures and post these either to Instagram or my blog, which has um, been a little bit in dormancy for a few months. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've been playing around with with different dyes and different methods of dyeing to produce colorways. So I've been doing things like that. This one's also, I really like this one too. Ooh. Well, I feel you crowing hen about coffee. <laughs> uh, I've been working like every day for weeks and today I took off. So um, 
I went out and played in the sunshine for a couple of hours during a picnic lunch and I am just completely shattered. I want to go to bed. <laughs> it's only four o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've also done a lot of dyeing of fleeces. So this is some blue face luster that I got ages ago. Um, and when you're dyeing in the kitchen, it takes up a lot of um, space and time. And if you only have one container, there's only so much you can dye at a time. So I've been doing small batches for ages, but with all these new containers, I can actually dye quite a lot more. And I also, I dug through the deep archive, which is my wool stash, and I found some Lester long wool that I hadn't dyed yet, so I got that done. And these are really lovely. Um, they come from one of my uh, guild mates. She's got Lester Longwell that's coveted by many people all over the world. So I'm lucky to um, be one of the select few who actually gets a fleece from her. Um, so yeah, those are going to go into the shop when I get around to photographing them. Which, for those of you who follow me on Instagram, I've just put up uh, some photos kind of showing off my newest um, background. Uh, I've been trying to find ways to streamline the process so that I can be more efficient about putting product up for sale. So that was one of them, <laughs> creating a new background. I've got like a weird reflection on my face. What is that coming from? Oh. Well, I don't think I actually did much about it. <laughs> oh yeah, the Lester Longwell is beautiful. Um, I bought two fleeces and I've only kept like a teeny tiny little bit for myself. Um, and I probably have one or two more batches left in my stash to dye. I've also got a whole load of Portland and I realized I've actually not done a fiber talk episode on Portland. So I will be doing that at some point uh, using this wool. Um, I just did rainbow dyes with this um, so that I could come up with a variety of different bats that would sort of like all kind of go together because it was done during the, at the same time. So yeah, well, that's nice. It's also um, a really soft wool. It comes from a tiny little sheep. They don't actually produce large fleeces. I think this, this is a, a seed bag, yeah. And I think I was given three fleeces, full fleeces, and they fit into two bags this size. So they're really small fleeces, but they have a, a pretty decent staple. So that's one staple length of Portland. And um, a pretty decent amount of crimp. I don't know if you could really see that in um, with my phone camera. But there's, it's a, it's a crimp that kind of is reminiscent of Blue Face Luster. It's not quite as shiny, but it looks a lot like it. Um, it feels slightly coarser than Blue Face Luster. Um, but it's otherwise really nice. Super long staple. I mean, look at that, jeez. Let's see the crimp there at the end. Yeah, so I will I will reserve some of this to do a fiber talk episode, and um, I've also got this here, which I got in Atlanta, Georgia, when I was there just before the pandemic really took hold. <laughs> so this is Gulf Coast native. And um, it was a process roving that I bought and then I've dyed it. So I've got a big bit of that and I've got a video coming out about this whenever I can get it into the editing schedule. <laughs> the list to try keeps getting longer. I know there's so much out there and I'm not even talking about which crossbreeds are really good because I have a, um, 
a Suffolk Blue Face Luster Cross, which is really, really soft. I'll show you. That's basically what this is. <laughs> Um, you can see a little bit of what I was talking about in the crimp. This isn't quite as crimpy as Blue Face Luster usually is, and I think that has to do with the, the Suffolk. Um, but it's really, really soft and extremely durable. Like, I could wear this next to skin very easily. Um, and I think in terms of a cross, it would be a really great um, workhorse fleece. I know we're getting a little off topic here. But yeah, it's beautiful uh, lock structure, nice crimp. <laughs> so there's that, um, and yeah, just doing loads of uh, dyeing, trying to uh, get back to basically the, the type of production level I used to be at before I, I left for Korea and um, obviously to do my PhD and things. So um, I'm hoping I'll be able to get a lot more bats into the shop than what I have. So we've got quite a few of you already with us today. So Crystal was here first thing. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure Crystal must be a real hoot to meet in person because the way that she types. <laughs> um, then we have Sonia, and we have Crowing Head, who actually has a YouTube channel. Um, so if she could post a link in the chat, you should be able to, um, to let other people know about your channel. Um, we have Jennifer, and I thought I saw someone else. Hold on, who else do we have? If I've missed you, just just let me know. Um, <laughs> yes, hugging the wool. <laughs> so, um, first, <clears throat> I wanted to show you what I've spun since last week. Oh. I'm like Captain Jean-Luc Picard who likes Earl Grey. <laughs> Um, so this is one full bobbin of flax that I spun from last week. During the live stream, I actually don't remember how much of this I completed. Uh, it was very slow going. I spun it dry. And I was just trying to get my head around this whole thing. Yes, Earl Grey is the best tea. I have one of those big mason jars. It's like, it's like literally this big. And um, I always have a pack of Earl Grey in reserve because I'm prone to drinking the last cup and then making a new batch and realizing I don't have any tea. <laughs> um, and I was, I was a little bit crazy. It just, like, I don't know why I decided to spin it this thin. But there you go. So that's the first bobbin completed. I, w I didn't actually weigh how much I put on the distaff before I started, but I presume it's pretty close to 50 grams. I weighed one bobbin <laughs> that was empty and subtracted it, and it was about 47 grams, which these can actually vary by a couple of grams um, for each, so I'm assuming it's probably about 50, 50 grams. So that bobbin is now done, and I've started on the second bobbin, so I did this this morning. And if you remember last week, I decided um, to dress the dye, the, I keep calling it a dye staff, sorry. I think I probably call it dye staff because it's a little bit like how you would pronounce dioxide, dye staff, but then, you know, this is obviously one piece, usually. Like, this one breaks up into two, but in the past they probably would have been one piece. But, yeah, anyway, so, apologies if I call it a die staff. <laughs> Distaff, whatever. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is an ongoing conversation I've been having with Crowing Hen about, um, 
and ways of doing and pronunciation and spellings of things. Um, so if you ever are curious why I'm saying them interchangeably like that, it's because I learned one way and most other people say another way, and so I haven't quite decided what I'm going to continue forward with calling it. <laughs> now, um, yeah, so the first iteration was really anemic looking. I decided to um, put only a little bit on there because I figured um, if I put a small amount on, then if something went horribly wrong while I started spinning it, it wouldn't ruin the whole piece. And so I did that a couple more times until I was done. And then this time I actually got a few more hints. Now, in the last video I talked about just watching a, a YouTube uh, tutorial by Josephine Watlin. And um, that's basically how I've modeled it again this time. I put the whole 50 grams on here and it has um, been just as easy to spin as a smaller amount. So there might be a point in which uh, there's too much to add, but 50 grams is pretty fine uh, for this. The other thing I did get was a hint from Pete, who also has a YouTube channel called A Bit Twisted. He's commented on the previous live stream. He suggested that I hackle this again, and I don't actually have a hackle. And so what I did use which, <laughs> now I don't know where I put it. Um, my long handled comb made out of antler. So I used that. Oh, I know where I put it. I'll be right back. I'll grab it because it is potentially quite useful to, to discuss. I've also decided to wrap the flex around um, with a piece of bulky merino yarn that I spun. Okay, so this is what I used for my Iron Age experiments because this was one of the tools that I researched for my doctorate. And this one specifically I have used for linen. I've used a piece of linen yarn on the end. So I always know that this one has to be used in linen contexts. So whether I'm going to be um, weaving linen or as I used it in this case, like I used it to brush out the ends of the flax. And um, I found it was actually really, really good for this purpose. And um, this is really interesting for me as a researcher because there's a lot of argument over how to use that particular tool. Potato, potato, exactly. <laughs> it was uh, called a rock in English? Wait, what? Interesting. Uh, also, Croing Hen has a, a book on linen, if she wants to link that uh, in her from her Etsy shop. Um, yeah, so uh, I thought it was. Oh, I did not get to see Evie's video. So I pretty much I work all day Friday and Saturday, and um, because I really really needed to just get out of the house and do nothing. <laughs> I ended up not being able to watch it earlier today, but I will be able to watch it going forward because I know that when she was here uh, in the live in my live stream last week, she got inspired by <laughs> my experience and decided to come up with that video. Um, so yeah, I definitely should um, watch it. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because she said that she was going to make an 80 wraps per inch yarn with her flax, which is really, really thin. Um, so yeah, thanks for reminding uh, everybody about that video. Um, definitely should watch it. Um, yeah. 
I didn't know she was spinning it from the fold. But I'm, I'm actually not surprised that you could spin flax from the fold. Um, so I've got an upcoming, my, my, the next tutorial that I'm going to put out is um, going to be about spinning or working with hemp. So for those of you who um, saw one of my face or Instagram posts, I was basically uh, baiting everyone to say flax, but it's actually hemp. <laughs> I don't think I'm in the right place to do a tutorial on flax yet. So, Curling Hen is a um, spinner of flax, and with her in the live stream, uh, maybe she can offer some pointers uh, for me and for those of you out there who are interested in giving this a go as well. Um, this is literally the second time that I have spun this or literally the second day. So first time was a week ago on Sunday and then I finished that first bobbin and then I gave this a go today, this morning, just so that you didn't see me um, fussing with this on the floor and the cats trying to help. <laughs> um, I also posted a video probably about two months ago where I talk about um, why spin flax wet or dry and um, this led to some discussion with the with fellow fiber arts creators and um, if you want to see some of the comments that uh, crowing hen has made on that video um, in case you are also wondering because I definitely was then feel free to uh, check out her responses and um, it really did clarify some major things for me because again that whole thing with terminology you know do you call it a, a distaff or a distaff um, my supervisors preferred to call um, the process of hackling heckling like with an e and um, it was difficult for me because from my perspective someone who is a heckler they are just an audience member causing problems at a, a comic show <laughs> they're just being annoying basically um yeah so i will say that Processing this strick or partial strick again with the comb did make the clumping go away a bit more than I thought it might. But there's still something with how you are dressing a, di a distaff that um, is probably the one thing that I feel is really holding me back from finding this completely enjoyable. So when it comes to spinning wool, I can spin wool with very little concentration, but I find with this flax, my spinning speed is extremely inconsistent, which I imagine it would be just because I'm not familiar with the staple length and the, the drafting style. But you see things like this, I can really see that. It just pulls out a big glob and then I end up setting this down and holding um, this between my hands and drafting it, which is also difficult because if you if you just pull back it it um, sloughs it up and makes a worse knot. So with the long um, staple length, I find that I kind of have to shimmy it. A little bit and so there's got there's definitely something wrong with the way that I'm either setting it up on the distaff or in the way that um, I'm holding everything and drafting it off because this should this does not happen to people who know what they're doing <laughs> I know that <laughs> logic is telling me that this is this is not the correct way 
<laughs> yeah, so Crying Hand said that sometimes it gets um, corrected to Hetchel rather than Heckle. And it was something that happened in the 70s. I'm also trying to um, spin this dry because I saw Evie do it and it looked pretty effortless. However, this has kind of led to another issue I've been mulling over, which is if I'm going to apply this, how am I going to do that? Am I going to do it wet? Can I do it? Can I apply it dry? Also, when it comes to applying, if I'm going this way with the yarn, all of the ends of the fibers are sticking this way, which means if I were to ply, I'd be plying from this direction, which means if I was running my fingers over the yarn, it would rough everything up. Oh, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> Crystal. <laughs> she said, um, I'm doing a good job holding of the, the distaff and drafting. So, Crowing Hen says, um, the, okay. Um, Crowing Hen says that um, the issue I was describing where fiber get pulled out in a clump like that happens to experienced flax spinners. I guess I'm a little mollified from that. <laughs> Because I find it just so frustrating. <clears throat> Whenever I, I spin wool, um, if I have to stop frequently to remove bits of vegetable matter, I get so upset. So I usually end up spending more time removing that kind of stuff when I can just because I I don't like interrupting the spinning process. So maybe that's just me being hyper specific about the drafting. <laughs> um, the other thing that Crowing Hen just mentioned was wrapping it in stiff paper, like a paper bag, like a grocery, like a grocery bag. You may need to um, elaborate on that, or if you've got a video or a blog or something where you can link to that, that would be super helpful as well. I mean, I can do all of this research on my own. This was uh, in part because I had had this flax for a couple of years and never worked with it. Um, so I thought during these live streams on Sundays where we're just kind of kicking back and relaxing and just rambling about whatever that I would give this a shot because um, I know that there are others out there that kind of get something on a whim and it sits there forever and then they decide, you know what, I'm just going to do it. And as a researcher, one of the issues that happens to me a lot is I get enamored with some idea that I'm researching and I will research it pretty much to as exhaustion as I can reasonably get to. <laughs> I mean, you'll never know everything about a particular topic, but I would just spend hours looking for every tiny little uh, reference to some idea I was, I was thinking about with my research. But what happens with a craft like this is, oh, excuse me, you spend a lot of time researching but not really a lot of time doing and at the end of doing all that research you kind of get that dopamine hit where it's like oh I've done something but then you don't actually get the satisfaction because you really don't know how to spin the fiber you just know a lot of the theory about it but experience is so important and it's so informative like <laughs> I knew quite a lot about the processing of flax and um, how you can identify flax under a microscope in various contexts, 
how flax degrades, like all that stuff, but I still had no idea how to spin it beyond the theory. And if I were to describe to you um, that experience theoretically, it probably wouldn't have reflected reality at all. Like Crowing Hen just pointed out that these kind of gnarls that happen also happen with um, spinners who are way better at this than me. So kind of called into question what I actually do know about that element. Oh dear. And I'm trying to not hold it up so high up here because if my hand gets a little sweaty, it's going to reactivate the pectin and then it's all going to stick together and I won't be able to draft it very well. It, yeah, so one of the things that I tried to do when I set up this um, particular batch was when you're separating, separating out the fibers, I had it all tied at the top, but I tried to separate all the fibers out into a fan. And then um, I kind of laid the next layer over the top and then I went back again and then four full times so that the fibers would be more individuated rather than right next to their neighbors. So um, yeah, I just wanted to get them disentangled during that stage so that I was less likely to pull a whole group down together because I thought that must be one of the main issues I was suffering from before where everything was too clumped together when I initially dressed it. So that could be, that could be one of the things. Yes, it's very easy to get lost in the words. That's, that's very true. Um, I heavily argued for doing experiments for my PhD, uh, partially just so that I understood what I was talking about. It's one of those things where um, you might understand the theory and can use the words of other people who have experiences, but there's really no substitute from like a personal understanding, I feel, when it comes to uh, craft production. You don't have to do it for your livelihood. You don't have to do it for, um, you know, survival or anything like that. And you don't really have to make it a distinct point in your uh, research. But what I do feel like it serves is that tactile understanding of what you're talking about so that you can be more clear when you're describing this um, in your research. But like I said, I just, if I, if I sat down to learn how to spin linen, I probably would be watching as many videos as I possibly could about it and reading blogs about it and not actually doing it. And since I had very limited time throughout the week to do things like this, I just wouldn't ever get around to actually spinning it. <laughs> I would just, I would just know a lot about it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> So many of the little fibers will go away once the yarn is boiled. Now this was mentioned uh, last week as well and I, I think I said something along the lines of I know you're supposed to finish it somehow and someone said washing soda and I don't think we have any but someone else said um, Sodium bicarbonate. Is that not an okay thing to use? And also, how much? How? Um, obviously, it's when it's applied. Oh. <laughs> Esme, Esme Cat um, is also in the chat. Hello, welcome. Oh dear. Yes, um, there's there's definitely a lot about the archaeological record that can be revealed through this process of making. 
Um, it definitely informed a lot of my ideas about Iron Age textile production, which I already I had already suspected must be the case because um, of my experience with making yarn and things. But being able to articulate it in the terms that um, would be acceptable for a doctorate, <laughs> um, you know, having uh, formal experiments like what I ended up creating was really helpful. Okay. I'm really struggling all of a sudden. I think it's just because the, the live stream is happening. I was doing this earlier today and I hardly had to stop when I first got started. So basically what you saw on the bobbin when I first started, I didn't actually have many interruptions. I'm gonna lower this just a bit. Like that. A couple of tablespoons until it feels slippery in the water. Okay. Flax is definitely camera shy. <laughs> yep. It's got it's gotta all stick together. <laughs> Something alkali. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I understand the feeling of being uh, called out <laughs> in a video. Um, I actually, I might, I might have told this story during a live stream in the past, but essentially what I did was um, I went to a... Gosh, I don't even remember what it was. It was like some kind of show and there were fleeces for sale and there was an older couple, they must have been retired, and they just grew a small batch of flax on their property to produce just enough for demonstrations. So whenever they'd have these like farm shows or whatever, they would show people how flax was um, harvested and um, redded and then processed for spinning and then they would spin a sample and I got like the tiniest little strick from them it was probably only about 20 grams maybe maybe 20 grams and I saved it in a little bundle and I thought one day when I'm better at spinning I will actually spin this but until then, I'm going to keep it just like this. And that was probably 2010 or thereabouts. Maybe 2000, two, no, it had to have been 2011. I think it was 2011. It's like the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. It felt so old fashioned. Like, even though I knew how to make yarn and um, some of the magic was kind of stripped away because I understood the process. I was still completely enamored with this elderly couple processing flax in front of me and then spinning it. So part of me wanted to spin it and part of me didn't want to spin it. So <laughs> if you have fiber like that living on in your stash, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> as long as you um, revere it enough to keep it tidy and free of bugs, just, just have it. Okay, so I don't know what this particular issue is now, but like this has pretty much stopped my entire spinning ability. Keeping the end of these fibers from getting all mushed up has been a real challenge during this live stream. I don't know, what, what kinds of things could we do to fix this? So, um, could do is I got this little tool here. I might just really quickly fluff this up a little bit and brush out the fibers. See, 
Is this a little more? I don't know if you can show you against my hair. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what to do. <laughs> my brain is uh, working on this problem because I feel like this is just me not understanding how to set things up. But yeah. I don't know. Should I have some moisture nearby? I mean, it's it's a pretty average day actually. It's only about um, it's about fifty nine percent relative humidity right now. In the house, it might be um, a little less humid. Could that could that be causing this problem? Is it just really dry? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As me. Um, she's got uh, Angora, Carbonite, Bamboo, and Yak. Yak is actually really lovely to spin. Um, I've made a pair of mittens with a Yak on the cuff just to give it some extra uh, warmth and softness. I don't know about you, but when I was younger, um, this was like a huge pet peeve of mine is when sweaters stopped here and this part of my wrist was exposed <laughs> I always make my stuff so that it's a little bit longer in that area or in this case with my fingerless mitts I uh, just use a really soft material um, I could do uh, some well I haven't done a fiber talk on yak because I was mainly focusing on uh, doing the wool uh, breeds that I had had in my stash first. But I could also switch to um, doing some maybe like mini fiber talk episodes as part of these live streams. Especially if you are looking for encouragement to break out stuff from the stash. Sometimes a project won't call to you until the yarn is made. Um, hemp can be processed in the same way as flax. So it can be um, harvested, redded, but from, from what I understood from some papers that I read in the 1980s that flax has to be pulled up by the root, but I think hemp doesn't have to be. I'm not sure about that though. Um, Sonia also said, I seem to remember hearing that a hemp mill is based on the design of a cotton gin. Interesting. So, um, Crowing Hen responded by saying that if you cut the fibers of flax and, and hemp in, um, in, in a process of cottonization, then you can use it um, with modified cotton machinery, which is kind of cool. So cotton is a, a staple about like that, whereas, you know, flax is pretty long and actually hemp is even longer. It barely fits on this thing. I did it uh, for my live stream for the Festival of Archaeology back in the summer of 2020. So if you want to see me do some awkward spinning. <laughs> Feel free to check out that live stream. <laughs> um, so my issue with the tangles could be because of there being shorter fibers.
Yep, that's definitely possible. Ever since I gave that bottom bit a comb, it has made the drafting part seem a little smoother. So it could just be that the ends were getting tangled on themselves and getting dragged down um, and clumping up. So this is a bit like how it was this morning when I was spinning. That was nice. I've also um, had some difficulty with tying it at the top. So that little bit that I've just pulled out, I could feel that it was tied at the top and almost didn't want to draft out. So I'm trying to get the right amount of um, tension uh, at the top here where it's tied and try to get just the right amount so that it's holding it and so when I'm pulling it I'm not just pulling everything but I'm not tying it so tight that when I go to pull it it just doesn't budge. Um, Lil Fair, welcome to the chat. Um, what does moisture do to the fiber? I noticed you had added some by licking your fingers. <laughs> yeah, so um, occasionally what happens is the fiber, it doesn't want to um, grab on in sort of the same way that wool does. But by adding some moisture, either through saliva or uh, water, you can actually um, get them to kind of stick together long enough for some twist to go into there. And uh, the saliva actually helps with reactivating the pectin, which is that glue-like substance um, in vast fibers like this. So, um, it's basically a way for me to feel confident that the joint is probably going to hold. <laughs> I've definitely had moments when it's been, when the joint is about here and then it just separates onto the bobbin. That's always annoying because then you have to hunt it down. And since this is really thin, um, it's, it's difficult to, to find sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see here, there was, um, ah, Crystal likes long sleeves too, go for your knuckles. My hands are always cold, so, um, it makes sense. I remember back when I first started knitting, I got really obsessed with those little, uh, wrist cuffs. You could put them on under stuff and um, it would help keep your uh, hands a little warmer. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes the project won't call to you until the yarn is made. This is exactly what happened to that hand spun v-neck sweater that I was um, working on before. I made the yarn, had no idea what to do with it, and then it just sat in my stash for ages. And then, um, okay, so not ages, maybe a, a month. <laughs> but then I wanted to take it out, see if I had enough yardage, and I'm just giving it a go. Why not? Um, Oh, so Sonia, um, being enterprising, was uh, interested in getting a hold of the stems because uh, the leaves are going to be used elsewhere uh, for hemp, and that would be a way to process it yourself. That's a really interesting idea. Hmm. 
I mean, presumably most fast fibers or uh, long stemmed uh, materials, you could spin like this. So the classic case is the use of nettle. You can harvest nettle and strip off the outside and spin it pretty much right away. You just um, have what's called like a green yarn. It's not been redded or anything. You can, I think, process nettle in a very similar way um, as you can uh, flax. There's a Facebook group called Nettles for Textiles. They would be able to answer that kind of question because um, presumably they've been asked um, questions about processing and hemp being a slightly less commercially used yarn or fabric, uh, fiber, they might have been asked that question. You never know, could be worth asking. <laughs> yeah, so the top of mine actually has a notch where the string goes in there. So you can't really see it now, but there's like this little uh, bulbous end here, and then there's an indentation, and then the rest of the die staff. Dis dis staff. Dis staff? Die staff. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> um, that's actually holding it really, really well. Okay. Oh, I I'm so glad people are being inspired by my ramblings. <laughs> um, but it's true. Um, I'm not, I want, I've always wanted to be a super creative person, but my brain has always gotten in the way because um, I can't I can't enjoy what my hands produce it has to be just like how it is in my head and I just don't have that kind of artistic ability so I've always habitually been extremely frustrated with my inability to produce inability to produce art and it's because I have this ill-conceived notion of what art should be. And I've always been massively disappointed with myself every single time I try to do it. And this is actually part of the reason why I took up watercolor as a New Year's crafting resolution in 2019, because I needed a, a way to kind of embrace the, um, the watercolor, because it just does stuff and you gotta work with it. So letting go and, and, and having things just be is really important because it's just a matter of perception. If you think about something with a slightly different view, whatever issue you had with that previously no longer seems to be um, negative or pessimistic. Sometimes this happens um, with uh, education where it has to be a top caliber thing but actually um, the more that I've researched about um, neurodivergent people the more I've realized that actually Part of the reason that um, different ways of thinking are important is because we need that difference, right? And as soon as you think about things differently, the world just, it's like it suddenly shifts. It's like bullet time. Like you see it from this perspective and then you're like, boom, way on the other side looking and be like, whoa. I hadn't thought of it that way. But when we're all thinking in similar channels, it's really difficult to, you know, even
conceive of there being another perspective until someone who thinks differently points it out, essentially. Um, oh, we've got a, a, a new person. Uh, Claudia? Hi. <laughs> Not sure which language that is. Yeah, so Sally Pointer has some videos on um, making nettle cordage, which is um, a way that people, um, sort of like in the Neolithic, for example, would have, could have produced um, bits of textiles for various purposes. In fact, this is actually one element about textile um, production and research on textile production largely overlooks the importance and value of because it's not as refined. Um, there's also like no tools, but um, it's definitely possible that people in Iron Age Britain grew stuff specifically for the making of cordage. We just don't have any evidence of it and um, because researching something that has no archaeological trace whatsoever is difficult it can't it can't be a research topic in the same sense but uh, from my experience with research it's like barely even mentioned um, so in my thesis, I made it a point to state specifically that I'm only talking about this specific thing because I only have scope to talk about this one specific thing. Um, but hopefully that lays groundwork for people to discuss other things um, relating to woven textiles because those loom weights need to be suspended somehow. and. Given what I've seen from um, looking at loom weights in person from my principal sites, you're probably not sticking these yarns through those little holes. You're probably using a cord to attach it to because um, there's evidence for it. So what is that cord being made out of? Spun yarn like this or cordage? My guess is it's probably cordage. Um, I'll have to do a follow-up video on my loom weights now that I've used them several times for experiments um, because there's some interesting um, facets that I have noticed on mine that I used uh, air dry clay with that would be uh, relevant for a discussion on how these types of tools were uh, used. Oh, tea has gotten a little cold. Um, let's see here. Oh, hi Evie. <laughs> I was talking about your video that I haven't had a chance to see it, but um, apparently you were spinning flax from the fold. So that's kind of cool. If you wanted to uh, post a link uh, to it, um, in case others here uh, don't know about you, you can, they can easily find it. <laughs> so I'm just kind of combing uh, the ends here again, because I think what's happening is my hand is sliding, my hand is sliding up and it's causing um, the bottom here to clump together again. And so I'm getting all those big clumps because this, this part is fine, but um, these kind of, oop, these little wispy bits here. So that, my guess is it's probably um, the either the ends of the fiber getting stuck up here, or they are the fluffy ends from the length that are just sticking to each other. 
So I'm just gonna work on this other side really quickly. But we are making some decent progress. I think having a little bit of a um, head start this morning has made me feel a little bit more accomplished. I would love to actually apply this. I actually, I don't have a hackle. This is it, this is all I have. <laughs> I have historically had very few tools in my arsenal. Um, I did get quite a few uh, for Christmases. Um, so I got my drum carter and a uh, blending board for uh, two different Christmases. But all the stuff to produce plant-based um, yarns, I just, I don't, <laughs> I don't have. Uh, when I was living in Korea, I watched some ethnographies of spinners in different countries, and I watched one lady process wool, or cotton, as a big batch on a, a bag of grain and a stick and it actually worked really really well so it fluffs up the fibers and it blends it all together and basically what you're left with is one big giant mat of cotton and I might have talked about this I've got a video called um, tax day cotton uh, tax day cotton challenge spinning challenge maybe um, but yeah, I, I struggled with spinning cotton there for a while, and then I watched this video of how she was processing it, and I was completely amazed. I was like, that, certainly that can't work, and then she spun it, and it was beautiful and perfect, and I was like, okay, so, you know, obviously I knew it was going to work. But, um, I actually gave it a shot, and it totally worked super duper well. So... Um, but something like that, all you need is a bag of grain and a stick, so, anyway, no, I don't have a, uh, an official hackle, and oh my gosh, this won't stay. So, um, I've just used my, uh, <laughs> my long handled comb from my experiments. <laughs> Does the kind of string like smoothness on the die stuff control the ease of drafting, like using rougher wool versus merino? Um, I imagine that this is what you would consider a finely hackled linen or flax. So, it it, I mean, the smoothness of the fibers, because they're all in order, yeah, I mean, it probably could relate to that. Oh, I, I missed that one. Um, Curling Head has also uh, mentioned another channel uh, that has some videos on... Uh, working with nettles. I am not going to pronounce it because it looks too difficult. <laughs> um, Sonia is interested in the loom weights, so <laughs> happy to oblige. <laughs> and then, um, a bit twisted says that, um, it's snagging because the long line is grabbing the short threads as they are being pulled and they bunch up eventually in the drafting area. Okay. Because where it is right now, this is actually really nice to draft. And that's in part because I've just now combed the ends again. So that they're not all fluffy and, and sticking up. Because what happens is if like a fiber gets stuck up. It's coming down this way, but if it gets like curled up a little bit at the end and then I drag the next one down Then that curl kind of like gets up and like caught 
on itself and probably its neighbors. And if that's happening to several fibers at different times or even the same time, it's causing uh, a lot of problem. Um, yeah, so I was advised to use a hair comb to hackle out my fibers. When I first, when I first got um, the linen or the flax, I don't think I mentioned it um, during the live stream last time. I basically just thought, oh, they must have done a really, really good job, so I'm just going to slap it on here and get to spinning. <laughs> But this is also where I, I really enjoy letting the fiber speak to me. And I know that sounds super hippy-dippy. But there is something very enjoyable about having some communique with your fiber of choice. So the flax is telling me what it can handle and what it can't. And it's... And it's um, manifesting that through my frustrations. So, um, you know, we talk about material agency in archaeology and this dialog dialectical exchange that occurs when you're working with the material. Um, but if you spend too much time researching it and then you have a greater sense of knowing, you actually miss out a little bit on the learning curve because you might understand theoretically why to do something a certain way uh, and then begin um, just spinning it a correct way. It also means that you're, I guess you're, you're robbed of the learning experience because you haven't done it wrong. <laughs> This probably sounds super controversial, um, but you know, in 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 my head, I know that this has to uh, spin smoothly because I've seen how other people have spun flax uh, can can do it quickly and two bobbins at the same time going at the same you know going at the same time. So how can you manage two fiber supplies? if you, you can only use one hand for it, right? So it has to be a smooth experience, and that comes with having a knowledge of the preparation from all the stages, um, having awareness of the spinning process, and working out exactly the uh, setup so that you can have that smooth experience. Well, if I don't have someone sitting here showing me who has had an entire lifetime of experiences and I'm not learning from scratch from that person, then I'm kind of discovering all of the ways not to do something because it's unlikely that I'm just going to happen across the, the one exact way to do it perfectly from start to finish. So there's going to, yeah, Schrodinger's flex. It's, it's, it's going to, um, teach me a lot if I just, with minimal uh, research, just jump in and say, oh, okay, so this isn't quite working as expected. So when I initially put some flax on here, I did a small amount just as a contingency against everything going horribly wrong. Okay. The silly thing. <laughs> I've had so many more issues with this setup during the live stream. <laughs> maybe it's just, maybe I'm creating a humid environment. <laughs> it's possible. This is not as crazy as it sounds. <laughs> oh dear. Um, oh, looks like Sonia is gone. Hopefully Sonia's had a good week coming up. <laughs> it has its own chaos theory. 
Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Oh no! No bully rebellion. <laughs> what sort of sheep do you have, by the way? I don't know if you're still here. <laughs> From future yarn. Yes. Let's not have future yarn rebel. Okay. Oh, Cotswolds. That was actually the very, very, very first yarn I ever processed and spun. It was um, given to the uh, instructor I had um, when I first started to learn how to make yarn. And um, I actually, I still have it. I, I posted it on my um, my Instagram a few months, well, probably about a year ago now. It's one of those um, rare breeds, endangered. Really shiny, really shiny fiber. Um. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by, Evie. Yes, we do not like our partners giving us giving us that look. <laughs> I've definitely had a couple of live streams where they've gone a bit late, and my partner's like desperate to eat dinner, and he's like, "Are you done?" <laughs> Um, yes, happy sheep makes happy yarn. <laughs> yes, Mark is famous writing all of those lovely messages in your um, advent calendars. <laughs> Okay, do we have any other questions? Um, I know that our um, expert on flax, uh, crowing hen, has now gone off to feed her flock, but if anyone has any uh, wool-related questions or um, anything else, uh, feel free to pop those into the chat. <laughs> Yeah, it's so sweet, just like the little sentiments um, that he wrote for her that she didn't know about until um, she recorded those videos. My partner's, um, <laughs> you know, like um, when you get into something and sometimes your partner like raises their eyebrows about something, um, he's, he's just like, I don't mind as long as you uh, end up making me something at some point. <laughs> so that's always a good sign. <laughs> I actually made him a um, Shetland hat for uh, last season when it was cold. And it, it was beautiful and it actually fit his head and, ke and kept him warm. And if you remember that video that I did where I made those um, wool-lined um, brummed mittens, I think it was a daily vlog episode, they've actually held up really, really well. They still have that fluffy thickness that made them look like oven mitts, but they kept his hands warm the entire time because uh, he has to work outside in the cafe that he's a manager of. So, um, the decision to use Zwarbles on the outside and uh, Merino on the inside was a good one. And they've held up very well against um, cycling. So, the, the grips on um, 
on the handles of bikes, they have a tendency to uh, cause weak spots in my mittens. And um, there aren't, there's no signs of any holes in those <laughs> mittens that I made for him, so that's good. <laughs> I'm hoping to get a couple of seasons out of them without really having to fix them. But I do have some of that yarn in reserve so that I can, I can do an invisible darn if it starts to get a little bit threadbare. And also, the, the Ryland mittens that I made two years ago, they still look perfect. They look brand new, like I've just finished knitting them. There's, there's no pilling, there's no weak spots, there's no um, obvious surface abrasion or felting. So they've also held up really, really well against cycling. And because those are also lined, um, they're very warm. So whenever I have to go to work, um, they keep my hands very warm. <laughs> See how much more enjoyable this is? So I've been I've been trying really hard to just um, keep my hand where it is without um, it sliding up too much. Because if it if it does that, then I think it it does something to the ends of the fibers here, and they clump up, and then it's a, a nightmare to spin it. So when I combed out this fiber before I put it on here. I combed from the middle to one end and then I flipped it around and combed from the middle to the other end. So there really shouldn't be much in the way of short fibers. But yeah, this is what it was like when I was spinning it this morning. And it's probably because I had only just started and so those ends were all nice and fluffed out. Yes, <laughs> Mark is the, the Vlogmas hero and cat castle builder. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, what I did was, you know how thrummed mittens on the inside, there's all that fluffy bit? What I did is I just knitted a plain mitten larger um, than it needed to be. And then I did a thrummed mitten lining for that mitten. So all the thrums are actually in between the two layers. So the way that um, I filled in, I put like bits of wool in between the thrums. So there's like a thrum piece, but also more wool in between so that it's, it's really thick. I did that with a view to um, ensuring that once they kind of like packed down more, they would still be impenetrable to the cold. Like he's going off to work in Siberia or something, I don't know. <laughs> I just didn't want him to have cold hands because if you work outside with um, anything wet, your hands just crack and they feel awful. Right? So my dad, he was a, a mail carrier for 40 years, so he was constantly suffering cracked fingers because they get wet and he was like thumbing through mail all the time. So that makes his fingers dry. And when it's cold, you know, we lived in the Midwest, so our winters um, could often be quite cold and, and dry. So um, because he's working at a cafe outside, um, I wanted to make sure that his hands would at least stay warm uh, to avoid that that drying issue that happens when your hands are wet and exposed all the time. Also, it's a matter of safety. If your hands are warm, you're more able to um, operate the controls of your bike. So it was, a, it was a little bit of a, a learning curve for him when he first started, but um, he got the hang of it and they're super effective. It's pretty easy to do. If you know how to make a, a normal mitten and you know how to make a thrummed mitten, then making the thrummed mitten the lining of a pair of mittens is, is 
pretty straightforward. Okay. So I'd say that's, um, that's, oh. <laughs> I was gonna say, that's, that's me ending on a high note. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well then, um, I might have to uh, wrap up the stream here now um, because I am still recuperating from pretty much, I had to make up extra work from when I was sick with COVID a few weeks ago. And then um, with all of this extra wool I've been dying, I've, I've had an extremely busy week. And then on Saturdays I work a 10 hour shift at the chocolate factory, or cho not chocolate factory, the chocolate shop in town. So I'm pretty pooped. Um, so I'm going to probably call it there. Um, if you are interested in anything in my shop, uh, feel free to take a look at expertlydye.com or the same on Etsy. And yeah, the flax knew what I was going to say. <laughs> it's like, you're not getting away that easy. <laughs> um, I, I really appreciate everyone who purchases from me because it does go towards supporting my existence. So if you want to keep me well fed, um, I appreciate it. Um, as I said at the start, there's going to be loads of stuff in the shop, um, more bats, but also some silk and uh, combed top braids that I've dyed. I've got, a, I've got some already in there, but I'm going to be adding a few more. Um, and yarn. I'm going to be putting some more yarn in there. Um, these will be repeatable colorways, so if you want to buy 18 skeins of something, then you will be able to get everything that color matches. So for those of you um, who don't know, this is actually what I established expertly dyed on being able to create colors consistent, consistently, no matter what I started with. So that came on the back end of my first master's degree, which I completed in 2010. So maybe I'll, I'll do a video about that uh, at some point in the future, because I kind of had sort of like a roundabout way getting into this. <laughs> um, but yeah, so... Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's actually not that bad in the UK in terms of temperature during the winter, but um, there were a few days in um, in the states where my mom is that I got to about minus forty degrees Fahrenheit, which is really cold. I'm just gonna spin on this this tiny little bit that got pulled out. So the main part of it was fine. It's just that little bit gets fluffed up and then causes basically like a yarn barf bit. So yeah. I'm sure there's probably a better way to do this than what I'm doing. Um, so yeah, um, I look forward to seeing you in the next live stream. I have a thought about what I'm going to do for the next live stream. I'm going to keep it secret for now, but it will uh, have nothing to do with flax, but I may revisit this flax uh, when it comes to uh, the plying stage. So um, I'm going to actually do a little bit of research on that because I don't want to, I really don't want to mess it up from this point. <laughs> it, took, it took so long and so much effort to get to this point. So I want to um, do the plying stage a little bit more intelligently um, than just giving it a go. So next week will be slightly different topic, 
Um, it may be a fiber talk episode, but probably not, because I know what I want to spin. I know there's no project tied to it, I just kind of want to do it. <laughs> anyway, so that is all for me. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, and all of the great advice, um, I have learned quite a lot just from having spun flax this way. Uh, there's definitely more to do, and all of that just comes with practice. So if there's anything that you're struggling with, whether it's spinning related, knitting, crafting, life, sometimes it's just a matter of, well, thinking about what the issue is and, and trying to find different ways to solve it, and then just keep doing it, just keep practicing. So, yeah. Um, yes, when I actually get around to playing, I will, I will show it in some form. I might show it in a professionally edited video, or I might do it in a live stream. So I will try to keep this information uh, public uh, as soon as I've decided. Um, but yeah, no, I think that would be an interesting thing to at least share with you guys, since you've, you've been here through day one and day two. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so thank you so much everyone for joining me and um, I will see you next week. Thanks for watching.